Hello and happy Sunday. Um, today I want to show you some of my favorite books. And um, these are just books I like to pick up and flip through sometimes or just give me pleasure for different reasons. And I hope you enjoy this video. Um, the first book I want to show you is this Star Trek 10 by James Blish. And if you are a Gen Xer, you're well aware of these books. Before um, Pocket Books got the license to make Star Trek books, which um, the very first one being the novelization of Star Trek The Motion Picture by Gene Roddenberry, all of the books were put out by Bantam. And these were all like fiction uh, based on Star Trek. This was your... Sometimes they had um, episodes. Um, and I believe all of these are um, episodes. But sometimes they were... Uh, different stories but these are novels of the episodes and James Blish added a lot of detail uh that came up like later on or sometimes it was discarded I'm not sure where these fall in the whole canonical thing but say you another thing about this is back in the um late 70s or mid to late 70s when these came out like this was published in um late 60s early 70s i'm guessing um 1974 there wasn't really if you didn't have star trek i mean you really rarely had a vcr so your only way to re relive some of these episodes was to read these books so here's you know six episodes in this book and i always loved the artwork on the cover because, you know, you see the Enterprise and you it was doing things you never got to see on the show. Like literally a phaser blast destroying the nacelle of this Klingon ship. And I'll read the back of it. It says, as the Enterprise hurtles through space, the crew must destroy a ravening murderous monster aboard the starship. Kirk discovers an incredibly beautiful creature with strange powers of healing. Spock views the forbidden um, Kalos and grows insane and more. Um, then be sure to look for Star Trek 1 through 9 and then the other books and about the author James Blish um, James Blish author of Bantam's popular Star Trek series once won the coveted Hugo Award for his novel A, A Case of Coincidence so this was this was it for back in the day if you wanted Star Trek and if you couldn't get the episodes you would just have to settle with a James Blish book. We had quite a few of these, and I don't know what happened to them. Probably sold them in a garage sale or something, but I do have this one left. So uh, it was on clearance for a dollar way back when. Um, this is a Sears Roebuck and Company uh, Consumer's Guide Fall 1909. It's basically a small reprint of the catalog. As you can see, it's very uh, small and maybe a little hard to read. Um, but you can see the stuff that was on sale in 1909. This was a really good faithful reprint uh, put out by Ventura Books in 1979. Has an intro explaining. Um, a look through the pages of this catalog is like a visit to early America. For what it mirrors is the dreams, hopes, and goals of people at the turn of the century. Um... And it's almost like Bible paper. It's very thin paper to get all to pack in all of this catalog, and you get everything. I mean, it has the introduction. It shows all of the the locations, the mailing center. I mean, this is a total faithful reprint. And look how small the writing is. <laughs> so you might need a magnifying glass to read it. Um, and then we get into the catalog and we start with jewelry. Pins like this, uh, a lot of men would wear these badges, especially like if they were in the... Uh, 
the Grand Army of the Republic or whatever, or if they were a certain profession, they would put this on with their dinnerware if they were going to some kind of party. Like, it, they would wear a badge for what their profession was. Here's um, watches. Pocket watches. I uh, don't believe wrist watches were much of a thing at this point. If they even existed, really. And these are watch fobs for your pocket watch. Um, and here we get to some jewelry. And um, just all kinds of rings. Some of them, uh, like the skull on it. You know, there's just some kind of uh, eerie rings back then. Uh, a lot of them would be pinky rings for men. Big old chunky rings. Here's a little trivia. Back at this time, when people got married, the only person who wore the wedding band was the wife. The husband didn't start wearing those until World War II. So if you see any movie where it shows a husband wearing a wedding ring prior to World War II, like a movie like The Untouchables with, that, with Kevin Costner, that's inaccurate. Um, men didn't wear wedding rings at all. It was unheard of. The only reason they started wearing them was the wives wanted them. They had learned their lesson from World War I, so the wives wanted them to wear those rings when they were in France to signify that they were married. So when all of the pretty French and Dutch ladies were there, the husbands would be faithful. Clocks. China cabinet contents. Uh, back then, they actually used it, but we have stuff like this in our China cabinet. We, my Mary, has a whole bunch of the whole set of plates and bowls and serving things and stuff. But they're nice, and she doesn't. We never use them, so we just keep them in the China cabinet. And they're uh, belong to her grandmother, so it's an heirloom. And um, ah, in Oregon, we. My uh, family house has an old organ like this that was probably purchased from this catalog. No, it's it's a little bit nicer. It's more like one of these. Yeah, it's very. It's actually pretty doggone close to that one. Violins. Also, we have three violins. Because back in this time period, you know, this is how you had music. You made your own. Unless you bought a, you know, a gramophone, but those were expensive. I mean, you can get a lute for five dollars and sixty-five cents, or a banjo for twenty bucks, or ten bucks, six bucks. Our ch challenge banjo. Um, so you could do dueling banjos for that. Two forty-five is the cheapest banjo. Auto harps. Uh, harmonicas. A very very cheap instrument this is the auto conductor um, metro metronome I believe yeah that's how it's pronounced I'm not I never actually took music I only took music classes but I never got to learn to play an instrument which is one of my biggest regrets from childhood here's buggies um, these buggies I mean we had cars at this point but buggies were the uh, still the most common mode of transportation. Horse-drawn buggies for twenty-seven dollars. You know, you had it was much much cheaper than a car. And saddles, if you were horseback riding, which many people still did, and many many different saddles. for a cat cameo she's in here and she's messing with stuff okay um here we got paint cans uh, look at that old barrel i mean look you would purchase something that would come in a barrel like that Can you imagine uh shotguns
the common house defense tool right here is the old double barrel shotgun. We had revolvers. Many of them looking like the traditional cowboy pistol, the, the uh, single action pistols. Many of them kind of resembling the Schofield. And look at that. You already have semi-automatic uh, um, pistols right there. Um, <laughs> if you need a pirate gun, you can still buy them back then. tools uh well no no this is reloading stuff uh, to make bullets bullet molds and so forth we're still on sporting goods here you know you got your hunting jackets and so forth tennis rackets sports shoes hammocks for leisure time when you're camping kayaks fishing tackle and lures Nets. I'm, yeah, uh, maybe we get to camera equipment here, which is uh, state of the art stuff. Binoculars, field glasses is what they called them back then. Telescopes. And we get to our music making machines right here. Um, the graphophone um, that played wax cylinders. Talking machine for public ex exhibition. Uh, just this is some state of the art stuff. I am not kidding. State of the art. Some medicines, stomach remedies. Uh, heart cure, uh, Brown's vegetable cure for female weakness, um, Dr. Rose's uh, arsenic complexion tablet, so I guess they have arsenic in them, um, female pills, blood pills, uh, blood builder, white lily face wash, this is the, you know, toiletry stuff, massage cream, hair restorer, Bust developer or bust cream. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's this complexion powder, cold cream, rouge, makeup, basically. This is makeup. Rocking chairs. Buffets. Bookcases. Old iron beds. Uh, I had one when I first moved out on my own that was given to me by my grandparents. And I wonder if the model that I slept on can be found in here. Um, it was, uh, that one. It also had their mold metal box springs included with it. Wood beds. Mattresses. Look how mattresses were made back then. Elastic felt mattress. Here's Trixie. She likes to be in the videos. Um, washing machines. They had them back then. This is a ringer. After you got done washing, you'd ring your clothes through and then you'd put a, you hang them out on a line to dry. Typewriters. Now we get to hardware. Uh, blacksmith tools. So these are specific tools for blacksmith work, like tongs and hammers and so forth. Um, 
And blacksmithing was a big part of life back then because metal fabrication was something you needed to do. There wasn't a way to just replace things all the time. You had to repair things or fashion things. Here's your stoves that your wife would have been excited about. Um, and I'm not saying that to be sexist. It's just a fact. Uh, I've read many, many old letters from those days, and that was usually something that was a hot topic for married women at that time was the acquisition of a stove that would make her life so much easier. Um, work shirts. Ties. Collars. See, you see these collars, it's because back then, um, shirts didn't have collars. You had to buy the collar. And they were metal, usually, underneath the fabric to stay stiff and look good. Here's boots for uh, ladies um, and men. Here's the fashionable suits for men. Pipes, because... Uh, you didn't go out without your tobacco. Here's grooming stuff for men. Combs, tobacco pouches, uh, beard, mustache and beard scissors. Brush, hair brushes, cufflinks. Here's stuff for ladies. These hats, kind of, this is the Titanic period, about three years from the Titanic. So you might recognize some of these looks. Um, corsets, uh, children's clothes, they look like little dolls in these pictures, don't they? Jackets, um, skirts, uh, Uh, th these are called waist, uh, shirt waists were basic, basically blouses. It was a new thing, and uh, before that, women just wore dresses. But the thing is, is shirt waist was an, a thing for modern women to take to work and be more comfortable. And there was a, a, a factory called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And in 1912, it burned down, killing all the ladies who worked there. It was really a tragic thing, and that was one of the things that gave us OSHA regulations. And then we get to farm equipment, shaving supplies, um, pocket knives, scissors, drapery, um, axe heads, planes, all kinds of hardware, hand saws, sinks, uh, bathroom stuff. So this gives you a... Uh, a good glimpse into 1909 and what people wanted or had, what things looked like. Um, I like this book. This is Destination Ooh because Mary and I love to watch Adventure Time, and it's just a funny cartoon. And I I like the humor. It's it's goofy, but sometimes it's a little poignant. Um, it says, "Welcome, traveler, to the mysterious land of Ooh." Home to creatures great, small, and cream-filled, this handy travel guide offers everything you need to know about your visit, whether you'll be hiking the mountains of the Ice Kingdom, relaxing on the shores of Lake um, Chesil, Chesil, I, can't, I haven't seen it in so long, I can't remember how to pronounce it, or dining on a delicious everything burrito. Um, I just liked it watching random episodes, but this is basically like a travel log of the different places in Ooh. with Finn the human and his and Jake his dog friend who is can pretty much do anything make recreate his body in all kinds of different shapes and all kinds of funny princesses and it, it, it's and vampire there's like a vampire friend he has um It's just, uh, yeah, basically like a travel book if you were to actually travel to the land of Ooh. And it's just kind of fun to flip through if you're bored. And it shows a lot of scenes from the show.
Um, the next one I'll show you is, is a book called My Year Flops. And uh, if you ever heard the term Manic Pixie Dream Girl, that's uh, it was coined in this book by Nathan Rabin. And it's about uh, the character in Elizabethtown and also the character in Garden State, played by um, Natalie Portman and um, the... Uh, oh, gosh, what's her name in, in Elizabethtown? Um, Kristen Dunst. So it's about basically bad movies, and I like reading about bad movies, but it, The Rocketeer, um, this is uh, John Wayne playing Genghis Khan, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, Battlefield Earth, Waterworld, um, uh, The Last Action Hero, Madonna, and any of her movies, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Howard the Duck, Sylvester Stallone in a movie called, um, uh, it was a sequel to Saturday Night Fever called Staying Alive, and of course Marlon Brando and his little creature in, um, uh, that weird movie, um, where he had the island, <laughs> I can't remember what it was called, it was really, really, really weird, um, But this is a whole year's worth of bad movie reviews, and it's a lot of fun to read if you, um, if you like bad movies. Um, apparently, I still had the books a million. Um, <laughs> like I joined the club when I bought this. Apparently, um, but it, it it just covers a lot of uh, fun. It's it's fun funny reviews of bad movies. You could put it like that. And he's obviously a really witty writer because he did coin. A very popular pop culture um, name in this. So he, Elizabeth Town is the one movie that he really just it drives him crazy. Uh, this is um, the Pinocchio version with Rob, Roberto Bernini. That was a flop. Um, He says, I'll be a bookmark for you. Um, my cat is just taking over this video. As you can see, she loves watching me make videos. And um, she's the sweetest little cat. She just loves to be in on everything. Marlon Brando um, in... Um, what was that movie? The Island of Doctor The Island of Doctor Moreau. Yeah, this is such a bad movie. Um uh, this is this is Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band with the Bee Gees and George Burns. The Love Guru with Mike Myers. So it, it, it's a lot of fun to read if you want to just enjoy thinking about bad movies. The next is Dungeons and Dragons Monsters and Creatures. This is like a, a budget version of a monster manual for five bucks. Um, explore the magical worlds of D&D. &D. And it's also targeted to young players, but it should have uh, some nice artwork. And it gives you the artwork and descriptions to get you excited about the game there has been somewhat of a revival of dungeons and dragons especially since stranger things came out um i don't know how effective it's been but um carrying crawler flump mind flare you might uh recognize that character from stranger things and something tells me they're gonna have the demogorgon in here because they know that stranger things got people excited so they the mind player and the demogorgon are put in a much more prominent place than they used to be in the monster manual the centaur and I, you know, Harry Potter. You, you think you, you kind of see, 
where they're going with the layout of a lot of these uh, creatures in terms of uh, pop culture. And they're trying to show people, Unicorn, that um, that D&D is, is something they might be interested in if they're interested in these things. So... Storm Giant. Um, Morris Bobs and Boneyards. Banshee. Skeleton. Vampires. Surprised they were closer to the front. Vampire Spawn. Got all your dragons. Tiamat. The chromatic. Chromium or chromatic, I think. And then I don't have Baja Met in here as a platinum dragon, but that's okay. But anyway, that's um, Monsters and Creatures, a pretty book full of great artwork. And finally, uh, I want to show you with Custer on the Little Bighorn, a first and only eyewitness account ever written. Oh, that was Fiona. She knocked over some things, of course. Um, this is, uh, an eyewitness account of the Battle of the Little Bighorn by William O. Taylor. Uh, as you can see, it's the old style. And, um, in this for some back, there's, uh, William O. Taylor. This for some background, um, the Battle of the Little Bighorn was a, was a conflict between the 7th U.S. Cavalry under, um, uh, overall under uh, General Terry with columns commanded by Custer and he split his columns well there was another there's uh, some other columns but um, Custer then had okay let me see he had I was in the Air Force so I don't exactly know how the army lays it out but he had it was a whole regiment I think or, or maybe and then the Custer was commanding the regiment. He had under him captains, and it was Benteen and Reno. He split them on June 23rd, uh, which made them much smaller forces, but he thought they'd move quicker. He turned down uh, Gatling guns and other things that might have helped them, and then he tried to take on the bulk of the Sioux and Cheyenne that had assembled in that area of the Little Bighorn. And his his column was wiped out. Benteen's and Reno's were uh, well. Reno's was was but decimated, and Benteen's was pretty much untouched. Here's the original book. Custer was killed there. Um, there is some gruesome pictures in here that I'll try to avoid. Um, the Indians at the Battle of the Little Bighorn were ferocious fighters and the um they managed to mutilate all of the uh the dead of the seventh cavalry um it's an interesting book about um custer was a, a, a youngest civil war general in the union army um he was uh criticized for being flamboyant and full of hubris. He also uh, wrote, many of his writings suggested a lot of sympathy and admiration for the Native Americans. Um, he uh, was a very complicated man of a, a lot of different angles. You cannot just judge him as evil or as good. Um, he definitely was both. He had tendencies towards both. So, um, but the mistakes he made at that battle, uh, the calls he made were very disastrous, especially splitting his, uh, his unit of cavalry. So, um, that definitely played right into 
Um, the Native Americans were led by a crazy horse and sitting bull and played right into them. Um, there is Custer... Um, with... I think that's his brother Tom, who won two Medal of Honors during the Civil War. Um, he he had another brother named Boston who was attached. He wasn't in the military, but he was serving. These are some of the Native Americans he was fighting, like Gaul and Rain in the Face. Um, a lot of a rid. This is kind of a, considered a primary source of. Uh, history so you could use this if you wanted to write about the little bighorn because this is a, a a person at the time who witnessed it sitting bull the overall leader another picture of custer um some bodies unknown remains on the battlefield uh photo taken in 1876 oh gun that was found on the battlefield just a really interesting uh history book about the battle an interesting topic an interesting battle anyway i hope you enjoyed this video and until next time i hope you like my channel please give me a thumbs up and leave a comment and subscribe and click the bell icon all of that helps the channel and uh until next time bye